Hello. Oh, the first Hello. thing Mark said to me this morning, he walked, literally walked through the door, and the first question he got, which is uh, usually the one I open with, is, is, when is the next book coming out? <laughs> and as I always say to people, and I do genuinely mean it, it's so nice that people want to know, because um, if, if no one was interested, it would be quite upsetting. Um, but the answer I gave him is the one I'll give you now, which is I really don't know. Um, it's, a, it's a huge, huge book, this next one. It's, um, it's, so, it's, it's a very complicated book to write. It, the amount of research is simply immense. And I've got so much research now that actually I kind of, I'm kind of drowning in it. And it's hard for me to actually put it in order, but that's part of what I do, that is the job. So, but it won't be out in 2020, which was my original hope. And uh, to be really honest, I don't know exactly when it's going to be out. Maybe next year I will have an idea. But um, it's coming, it is coming, but you know, just take good care of yourselves. And keep eating the broccoli. I will do the same. Yes, I will. I'll keep taking the vitamins. And uh, I feel fine, so uh, everything should be all right, but I'm aware that time is moving on uh, for myself as well as for everybody else. So uh, I'm not dragging my heels, but it is a big job. Um, at the end of the three books, it will have been about 30 years full time. And so far I've done 15. So I'm about halfway through the big job. Um, so. Volume two will be, I'll start to write it quite soon. I haven't started writing it yet. Um, and then it will be out when it's done. But, uh, so yeah, that's it. And it will be worth year. the wait. It will be worth the wait, but... Um, it will wait, it's not both ways, wait out. Yeah, yeah, it will be the best doorstop you've ever had. In fact, they're planting a the forest now to make sure... <laughs> <you don't laughs> so, yeah, yes. Well, that's enough from me. I'm going to pass it straight out to the audience. Yeah, and I can fire your own questions. So, yeah. hands up and questions will be asked. I'm happy to answer anything about anything. That's the first one. And feel free not to be shy. So, who's the couple of people that have been dead and would like to interview? And the couple of people that are living that you've watched? Who are the people who are now dead that I would like to have interviewed and the people who are alive that I haven't interviewed that I would like to interview? Um, uh, well, Neil Aspinall, I suppose, is top of the pile. Um, well, John Lennon, actually, and George Harrison would be ultimate top, but uh, Neil Aspinall uh, probably needs no introduction here. The Beatles' essential right-hand man from 1960-61 until he left their employment in about 2006, I think it was, or maybe seven, 2007. Um, Neil was one of those guys who would not give interviews to anybody. He was employed by them and he was a man who could be trusted with every confidence and held them all. And um, he could be nicely indiscreet uh, in, in a one-to-one -one if he were just sitting in his office, but if he knew that it was for the record, he wouldn't speak at all. So uh, he knew that I was after him for years. Uh, when I began this project, he was the first person I told I was doing it. And um, when eventually he, he left Apple, I, he phoned me up and said, okay, let's do it. Which meant, in essence, let's, you know, what do you want to know? You know, let's sit down and talk. And there was a book that I read many years ago called Tuesdays with Maury, um, a very fine book about this man who was dying and someone had an appointment with him every Tuesday and would go and get his life story from him before he died. And I didn't yet know Neil was ill, but I kind of had it in mind, the Tuesdays with Neil kind of book or, or idea, where once a week or so I would go and see him and get another couple of hours from him. But what actually happened was I sat down with him once and, um, and then I didn't push it too hard for the next one because he wasn't entirely comfortable. He hadn't ever spoken, so and I was asking him for everything. And then he went off to New York and never came back. He got cancer and died. And so Neil Aspinall is a big, big miss for this project. Even though he's in it, he's not in it anything like as much as I would love him to have been. And he took with him to the grave hundreds, thousands of things that we would love to have known and we never now will. 
So th this history I'm writing, which is as thorough and as complete as possible, could have been more so if he was still with us. And that's typical of pretty much everybody. If you're writing any story, there's always going to be people you can't get to. And Neil was one, Mal Evans, of course, was another. Yeah. Um, so that those are the deceased people who I can't speak to. Um, on the living side, um, I suppose number one is probably Jane, Jane Asher, because she just won't speak to anybody, um, which is something I completely respect. I, I, I have such admiration for someone who won't tell all the stories, because that is so rare. And um, that's, you know, for her to change her mind, for her to give an interview now, <clears throat> she will have to come to a point where she's changing her own mind on something that she's been very fixed on for almost 50 years now. In fact, exactly 50 years. It's 50 years last month since she and Paul broke up. And she's never talked to anybody. I have now had a meeting with her, a one-to-one. -one. I gave her the, the full edition of Tune In. Um, with a letter saying, you can see what I'm doing, I will respect whatever you tell me, uh, you can have approval of it if you like, I mean, you know, if, whatever you need that makes you feel comfortable, uh, it's available to you because I want to honour what you remember and not in any way deceive you. Um, and she wrote me a, a note saying, pretty much no, my answer, my answer is still no, but who knows, maybe one day. And so I hold out hope, but she will have to come to her own uh, decision on that one. She can't be forced, so I've left it in her court. Um, so she's the number one person who's alive who I'd like to speak to. Yeah. Next question, front row. Yeah. Uh, the question was about following on from the one about Neil Aspinall. Uh, Neil began a film about the Beatles way, way back in about 1970 called The Long and Winding Road, and it was a history of the Beatles made by the Beatles, financed by the Beatles. Um, what happened to it? Did it ever get finished and did I ever see it? Right? That was the question. Actually, it did pretty, it got finished to what would be called, I suppose, a rough assembly. Um, the footage was actually compiled, it was harvested from around the world, it was compiled into a, a, a usable order. Um, but when you would then do what's probably called an online, is that right? The opposite of an offline, whatever that is, where you actually really piece it together in high quality and make it all seamless, I don't think that ever got done. Um, but the, that version of The Long Winding Road is now circulating as a DVD. Um, I mean, I bought it about three or four years ago on the open market. You can buy The Long and Winding Road. Is it HMC or something like that? One of the bootleg labels? They put it out. So it does exist. And I also I had the, the privilege of actually watching it with Neil Aspinall in Apple <clears throat> in about 1991. <clears throat> and uh, I, I didn't think I'd ever see it again. So while it was on, I'm writing it down. I'm writing the whole thing down. Every clip I recognise what where it goes from A to B to C to D. And Neil's going, what you're writing all that down for? And I was like, well, you know, I'm not going to publish it, but I just need to, you know, I'll be wondering later, what did I see? What did I see? Just need to record it. So, yeah, it, it's around. And in fact, it's probably here today. I haven't been around the tables enough, but I expect it's here today. It's the rough, so, it is the rough version. The rough. Mm. I'm sure some of the dealers out there will be having it today. Yeah, it's the only edit of the film that there was, 1991, that I saw it, but it had been in that form for 20 years. And I remember um, when Eric Idle was making The Ruffles, um, so this would be about 1977, um, George Harrison uh, said to Neil Aspinall, you've got to show it to Eric Idle. So Eric Idle based the Ruffles on the Long and Winding Road, even though we hadn't seen that film, we hadn't seen it, he had, and that's kind of formed the basis of the Ruffles. Mm. It's very similar sort of editing, very choppy. Yeah, yeah. Very clever how he, how he moved it. Yeah. In fact, some of the film in the Ruffles, they got the, the film, the go-karts, but that didn't appear. No, that's right. It's the 80s. Yeah. yeah Neil, um, Eric Idle and Neil Lynch, they, they filmed that back in 
Yeah, 77, 77, 77, 78, yeah. yeah. To put it in the rubble, so yeah. they were privy to quite a bit. Yeah, because, because of George, George, George said to Neil, you've got to show it to them. Yeah. It's also yeah. interesting because there's things missing from it. There's like no jukebox jewelry, yeah. which 1970, if it did exist, I'm sure they would have pinched a piece of it and just put it yeah. in somewhere. So the films that are, are missing now were missing then. Yeah, sort of yeah. Thing. so it's a good little marker in history because it started in 70. Yeah and went through the next couple of years. So what's missing from that is still missing, basically. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, let's go yeah. to the table from the side. There you go, check the note. In complete recording sessions, you documented the sessions to a very fine detail. I'm wondering if that level of detail exists for the extra Beatle recording sessions, uh, Family Way, Wonderwall, uh, Doris Joy, Billy Preston, Right. All the other things. All the other <clears throat> Does that exist and is that part of the scope of the next one? Um, so the question was in my book, The Complete Beatles Recording Sessions, which is 30 years old next month, by the way. <laughs> Don't know how that happened. Um, uh, I document the Beatles sessions in detail. Does that level of information exist for other projects like The Family Way, Wonderwall? Doris Troy, Mary Hopkins, Jackie Lomax, all that kind of other things that the guys did. Um, and the answer is yes for some of it, but not for all of it. Basically, EMI was a very good company for paperwork. So the, the engineers on sessions were trained to keep a paper record, a recording sheet would be filled out for every session. And there was also other kinds of paperwork like studio bookings, diaries and such like. That lot all, everything at EMI therefore got kept. But as soon as the Beatles began to do things out in outside studios, there's virtually no paperwork at all because they weren't bothered with it. Um, which is why there can't ever really be a Rolling Stones recording sessions book because all the, the, some of the tapes exist and not others and no paperwork exists at all as far as I'm aware. Um, so EMI was, you know, it, the staff had proper training and they were good at record keeping. So we have that information. But um, I don't think it's as strong for other things. Family way, not really, no. Does that extend to the first solo albums that were done at EMI? Does it extend to the first solo, solo albums? Yes. Whenever anything was done at Abbey Road, there was a log sheet, a tape library log, a recording sheet, and usually a book in the form. And, and so the early, quite a lot of Wings stuff exists in paper in that same way, uh, at least until Paul started using other studios. Um, John Lennon Plastic Ono Band was recorded at Abbey Road, so that has sheets. Quite a lot of all things must pass. The bits done at EMI have information. But again, when they went out to Trident or other studios, no, nothing. So it's incomplete post Beatles, basically. It's incomplete. Mm. Mm -hmm. Good answer. All right, on the back. Yeah, does the other bit in still footage, the last of exist anywhere as well? Do you think there's any chance of Let It Be because it's eventually released as a DVD of uh, some of the outtakes of the film footage from the last movie released? Does the unreleased film footage for Let It Be survive? Is it, does yeah. it exist and, and where is it and are they going to do something with it if it does exist? Yes, it all exists. Every single mo moment of it. Um, and I've seen a little of it, just a little bit. It, when was it? 2002. Um, Apple were beginning to think of doing a DVD of the Let It Be film and I was brought in to um, conduct the extras, to, to put the extras together for the DVD. So I interviewed Neil on camera, Michael Lindsay Hogg, we got the two policemen back, the guys who go up on the roof and stop the show, we got them back at Savile Row. Um, uh, quite a few other people who were involved in, in the, the sessions. But that in itself is now 16 years ago. And at that time, um, they got all the film out of the vault and the man was put in charge of piecing it all back together, you know, actually assessing what they had, colour correcting it. It's a, that's where I saw only a little bit of it, but it was stunning. Actually, in the anthology, they've got some of it in there and you can see how, how good it is. Much, much sharper, more realistic colour than in the Lady B film. Um, which was a bit grainy. So yes, it all exists and it's beautiful, but it hasn't come out yet, despite the fact that they had a budget for the DVD 16 years ago, 
it hasn't come out yet and you can only speculate as to why but I think the chief reason has to be that there was never great happiness about that film way back in 1969-70 uh, and because of that those those reasons for being unhappy with it are still around they, they haven't gone away so um, I, I still feel sure that at some point it is going to come but for the time being it's being held up by some by a lack of approval I guess you would call it everything the Beatles do and when I say Beatles I now mean Paul, Ringo, Yoko, Olivia because they, are, they own it between them um, they will only do things if all four of them are unanimous if it's three and one it won't happen so at least one of the four and maybe or two or three or four are saying no to the, at the present time but I have no inside track on that anymore. Yeah. We're talking of fingers crossed on 2020 is the 50th anniversary of Let It Be being yeah. issued. So if they carry on the reissues, Pepper, White Album, Abbey Road. Yeah, if I've, that happens, but nobody seems to uh, yes. know yet for sure. So I mean, well, next January, which is five months away, is the 50th anniversary of the Rooftop show. Um, that would be a wonderful thing. They could put out the whole 42 minutes of that. Um, even if they don't sell it, they could put it on, on, up on YouTube, you know, the whole film of it. In fact, they've got different camera angles of the whole thing, so they could really make a production of it. And maybe they are. I really don't know. I'm not to, you know, I don't know. So maybe it's all in hand already, but I haven't heard anything. Mm. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Because, yeah. Well. Did Yoko have her camera working at those sessions as well? I don't know. Do you, do you know if she did? Right, I did once see an inventory of the Lennon Ono film archive, and it did have quite a lot of the Let It Be film in it, but I, I had assumed that it was from the main shoot. I didn't pause to think that possibly it was from her own cameras. Are there other cameras there apart from Michael Lindsay Hogg's cameras? You, I, I don't think you see any in photographs, do you? Are there any? Not yeah, so. no. Well, there's none in shot, for example. No, there's none in shot, but I mean, yeah, possibly. Nothing I know of there. But didn't they do, didn't mm. they do a similar thing for the Rock and Roll Circus? There's a, there's a John and Yoko yeah. camera man working. Is there? Me. <coughs> right, so well, maybe, yeah. It's one of those, there's no yeah. proof, I suppose. But she wouldn't be able to do anything with it um, because it requires all four of them to give their permission. Mm. There you go. Back to the front again? No, I'll yeah. you a second. Just back to the front. Yeah. Yeah, why was I brought in on the Let It Be DVD program if, if it hadn't already been pre-approved, as it were? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know, maybe, maybe, um, maybe minds were changed, you know, anything's possible. I, I'm certain I'm right in the sense that, I mean, if they all wanted it out, it would happen. So if, therefore, flip that round, if it, if it hasn't happened, there's got to be a reason, and the reason is not, you know, that they haven't approved. Um, even though they spent some money on the DVD from 16 years ago, um, you know, they can afford it. Um, <laughs> so, you know, maybe they just did it for the long term. That's another possibility, whilst people were still alive to tell the story. Mm. Just, yeah. just set the chat behind you first, first, and then we'll come to you second. Yeah. Um, my, my question uh, is, uh, you know, you Pete Best. Yeah, Pete Best, yes. Um, Yeah. Um, to discuss what happened years ago. Yeah. And for some reason, all the time, it doesn't seem to want to do that. Right. Um, and I wondered whether there was something related back to when he was thrown out of the Beatles, and that's why that movie doesn't take place. 
Well, it, okay, the question was about Pete Best, um, who has expressed interest publicly in meeting Paul McCartney to talk about old times, and I suppose, you know, why he was kicked out uh, 56 years ago. Um, <laughs> And, and Paul, if it, if it hasn't happened, um, which we assume it hasn't, I mean, it could happen privately and we wouldn't know, but if it hasn't happened, is this because Paul doesn't want to see him? Is it, was that your question? Well, I mean, the, the fullest honest answer is because it's not about me, it's between two guys, I don't know. I don't know, I've, I've, only Paul could answer why he hasn't seen Pete. Um, so beyond that, we can only Hazard a guess or two. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I don't think he, they hold any grudge against Pete. And um, that you know, he has talked of him. If you go to the new, what I call Rogues Gallery, uh, in Matthew Street, the new Beatles Museum, um, then you will see uh, there's a video clip of Paul speaking about the Cas Bar and about Mrs. Best and, and Pete and so on, with no animosity and there's no real reason why they would be either. So I don't know why they haven't met, um, other than the fact that Paul is a busy guy and, you know, he and Pete aren't naturally in the same orbit, they would have to have an appointment and maybe it just hasn't happened. But they don't have any real problem with Pete and there's no reason why they would. And, and as for Pete, you know, possibly needing to find out more about why he was sacked, I mean, I have talked about this before at this event. Um, he knows why he was fired. He just says he doesn't know because it, it upholds his dignity, which of course we can understand and respect. But he was told why he was fired and whether or not he chose to believe it is another matter, but he, he was acquainted with the facts. But he, he he's easier for him, I think, to say he doesn't know why, because it just avoids, you know, having to go into too much detail. He was sacked because John Paul and George didn't think he was a very good drummer. Yeah, yeah. And, and they wanted Ringo instead. Yes, that's exactly why. Mm. Right the front. Just harking back to the conversation about why hasn't I was wondering if you could talk about your involvement in something like a couple of projects. Yeah. Yes, no, the um so the question was about some of the archival projects I have been involved in involved with like the Beatles anthology and um, the Beatles recording sessions book in particular. Um, well, you always have to look at who owns the material. In terms of the recording sessions book, um, all the tapes are owned by EMI. EMI may it rest in peace because EMI doesn't exist anymore, it's now just universal music, but at that time EMI Records was the owner of the Beatles catalogue in terms of recordings. Uh, and they were not on good terms with Apple at that time. <clears throat> so there was no need for consultation with Apple. EMI decided they wanted to have a book on their recording sessions, on the Beatles sessions. Uh, and they, there had been a man called John Barrett, who had been, was an engineer at Abbey Road. He had been logging the sessions and listening to them and evaluating material for possible release as a kind of new Beatles album. <clears throat> um, so John Barrett died and they brought me in to write the book based on his research. Uh, no consultation with the Beatles was needed. Um, I did reach out to Paul, George and Ringo for interviews. George and Ringo didn't reply. Paul gave me two interviews, which is why he's at the start of that book. Um, and, and, you know, was happy for it to appear as well because he wanted to read about it about all the stuff they've done. Um, so that was that. The anthology, however, was an Apple project. And by this point, the settlement of a number of their legal difficulties had caused the implementation of um, e Apple's insistence that EMI doesn't do anything to do with the Beatles ever again. 
without their approval. Arguably, had that agreement been in place in 1987, the recording sessions book would never have happened. Because they, Apple, the Beatles may not have wanted their stuff written about in that way. And certainly, well, not necessarily by me, it might have been somebody else. But because it was an EMI project, it happened. And then the anthology was Apple's project, so by that point, if they said jump to EMI, EMI jumped. And um, I was brought in by pretty much all the parties on that project to, to help George Martin and help research the TV and then to write the sleeveless. Uh, the, the anthology book, however, was nothing to do with me, except that I, I did a read of it for, for factual errors and, and that kind of thing, which I did. But, that's why my name is in it, but it wasn't really anything else to do with me. Oh, yeah. mm. Question over there? I guess just following on from that, um, have you had the opportunity prior to Sir George Martin's passing to have discussions with him in relation to any of the information that we had to uh, all these years? And, and if not, has Sir Lady Martin, uh, Lady Martin been, uh, any, any assistance to you? <clears throat> So was, did George Martin give me any feedback on tuning? Uh, and has Lady Judy Martin given me any help since then? Since then? No, in both counts. I mean, uh, when did George die? Was it 16? Was it March 2016? And the book came out in October 2013, so a good couple of years earlier, but he was not in the best of shape by then. He, I mean, when tuning came out, he was already 80, 87, I think, something like that. So no, I don't know even if he read it. Um, I imagine Lady Judy Martin has read it, or at least has read, done that thing that probably many people do of looking themselves up in the index and checking the references. And um, I don't think she's best pleased with some of the things I wrote, so I don't really have any connection to the Martin family anymore, I'm afraid to say. Question the yeah. Uh, just, uh, just a follow-up. Uh, uh, I was going to say, it's obviously the tune in the from the sort of early 60s to all this, sorry, early early uh, years ago, that sounds a good job, but it was Kim Bennett, that's the next one, you know, great piece of work when you've got to get all that uh, information, it's a great story. Yeah. From, the, from your punching in, have you got any more? <laughs> Did you get any more? Were you able to get any more from any other? Yeah, I mean, so the question, there's, a, there's a, an unsung hero in the Beatles story. Probably the only people in this room who will, have, who will know his name are, will be those people who read my book, Tune In. Uh, his name is Kim Bennett, <clears throat> and he was a song plugger at a music publishing company in London called Ardmore and Beechwood, which was EMI's own music publishing company. And if it hadn't have been for him, the Beatles wouldn't have a recording contract. Um, and, and I Love Me Do may not have been a hit. So he was, he was seriously important in actually getting the Beatles off the ground. But he was never written about in any book and he was marginalised quite quickly. Uh, and kind of Ardmore and Beechwood's involvement in things was kind of hidden away. And um, the, 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 they published Love Me Do and P.S. I Love You, the two sides of the Beatles' first single. But with their second single, the publishing went to Dick James instead. <coughs> Our World Beach would have it taken away from them. Um, so that is a great story, because this guy is one of those, he's a vital link in the chain. And if, like any link in any chain, if you take it out, the thing kind of falls apart. I'm not too sure that the Beatles would never have made it without him, but um, without him, they probably wouldn't have got to George Martin. So things would have been radically different. And yet we really don't know much about him. And it was, um, I was looking for him for years and eventually found him and paid for him to come up to, well, brought him up to where I live and paid to put him up in a hotel overnight so I could interview him over two days. And we really, really went through it carefully. And it was, it's a great story. And I really tested his story, you know, with paperwork and such like. And he was an important man. And since TuneIn has come out, I haven't had nothing of that magnitude really, but more information is continually coming up that I didn't know. Because you, information is not, it's not finite. You know, you can't say that's it, there's nothing more to be found out about that. 
um, especially with a story as broad and deep as the Beatles, and with so many people having an association with it, there are always going to be people who can tell you something that you didn't already know. And yeah, TuneIn is in itself, by its very publication, it has sparked some new things to be to come out of the woodwork, um, which eventually one day I will fold into some kind of an updated edition. But I won't do any updates of any kind until all three books are out, because there's no point in confusing the marketplace with a new version of something you know that only came out four or five years ago. Mm. There you go. One answer. <clears throat> One side there. Yeah. Hello. Uh, uh, I came from Japan. This is my first meeting. Good. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> I have a, a friend who researches Beatles, and this question is from him. Okay. Do you need any help for writing your Beatles biography? <laughs> As to obtaining information on the Beatles Japanese tour, mm -hmm. 1966. Yes. Or related things in Japan. This is this question. Well, that's a very, <coughs> a very nice question to be asked. Um, I don't, I don't know that uh, of anything I need in as much as I have plenty um, because it's well documented that tour and it's also this film of it and audio so I'm not short of material um, but if he has if your friend has the inside track on something that isn't generally circulating that isn't around then of course I'd be pleased to hear it and this goes for all aspects of the Beatles history I'm always pleased to be told of something that I might not know or be shown a piece of paper that I might not have seen. So yes, 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 I'm, I'm interested, but it would have to be something that I, he, you know, I, I almost certainly won't have. I mean, it was very well photographed, so I've got all the photographs. It was filmed, I've got all the film, I've got the newspaper reports, and I've got um, some translations already or first-hand witnesses to people outside the hotel and inside the Buddha Khan. So I'm pretty strong on it, but I don't like to say no, because it could be something I'll be very pleased to say, but kept an open mind to. You have to keep an open mind. You know, you, you can't ever think you know it all on anything in life, generally, you know. And that, there are people who say, you know everything there is to know about the Beatles, which is ridiculous, because <laughs> I don't. Uh, for a start, there's everything I don't know. <clears throat> and I don't know what that is, <clears throat> but I mean, no one knows everything about anything. So um, I have an open mind that if there's something strong that he feels I might not know about, then I'd be pleased if he shared it. Hmm. Thank you. Hmm. In the middle again? Yeah. Uh, Mark, forgive um, me for repeating a question I put forward two years ago. Um, as regards to the trilogy that you write, yeah. Where will volumes two and three of the trilogy I'm writing? Where will the where will volume two end and three begin? And where will the three end? Um, and the answer I gave you two years ago is still quite the same, which is I don't really know and I don't need to know because I'm not there yet, and the information that the, you know the material itself will tell me um, where best it can it, it can be broken. Um, but the likelihood is it will be um, the end of 66 or thereabouts and then the end of 70, probably New Year's Eve, perhaps New Year's Eve in both cases. Um, and that therefore 31st of December 70 will be when Paul files suit for the appointment of a receiver um, to take control of their finances. Um, and then you may have heard or, or may not have heard me say this, but this trilogy might ultimately become four books. 
um, a trilogy in four parts because health permitting, sanity permitting, um, I'd like to write a fourth one which will go on to probably the 31st of December 74 because that will be when they signed the, the dissolution agreement that took four years to thrash out. So that would mean all four books ending each respectively on the 31st of December, which is quite tidy. Um, so I probably will do that, but I am still open to the possibility of, of changing my mind once I see, once I'm writing it and I see. Yes, Patty Boyd was here today. Have I been able to get information from Patty? Yes. Yes, I have. Um, I first, I didn't ever really push to meet her uh, until the moment was right, and I actually didn't meet her until I interviewed her on stage here about four years ago, I think it was. Uh, yeah, this was, I think, her third trip here. And, um, but as a result of gaining her confidence that day here in the Adelphi, I then made a, an approach which she was receptive to, and I've had about seven or eight interview sessions with Patty, including going through her diaries, um, which is very good, very good. So, yeah. so, got a question right down the front first, then we'll come to you and then to you. A question about the recent catch, uh, um, the fallout between my age and Bill Bedman. Yes. Uh, Cindy Boyd, the presentation of first day, yes. because she claimed that the magic palette yeah. uh, was sort of inspiring the bad mouth thing, Irish shit. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, I've got it. Okay, I'll repeat that. <clears throat> um, it's always said that the, when John and Cynthia and George and Patty stormed out of the Maharishi's ashram in Rishikesh in 1968, that um, Maharishi had been behaving inappropriately with one or more women uh, students at the, at the ashram uh, and, and John confronted him with it. This is what John said. Um, and Maharishi, in his mind, didn't put up a good enough defense, so they stormed out. Um, but Jenny Boyd, who was in Liverpool, was she in Liverpool on Thursday, <clears throat> um, did a talk on Thursday in which she said that actually uh, the Beatles' electronics friend Alexis Mardas, Magic Alex, um, had sowed the seeds of discord, had, had basically cooked up a rumour about Maharishi in order to kind of get John and George away from his influence, John in particular. Um, and, and that's the real reason why Maharishi wasn't guilty of anything wrong after all. I should preface my answer by saying I wasn't there. Um, but actually, I was indirectly responsible a few years ago for Magic Alex suing the New York Times um, because one of the writers on the New York Times, Alan Cozin, called him a charlatan in print. Um, being that, you know, he was meant to be this electronics wizard, this genius, and actually he wasn't anything of the sort and nothing he ever did actually really came to anything, so he was a charlatan. Magic Alex sued them, sued the New York Times, and as a consequence of that, pretty much every living person who was at the ashram in that period of time in 68 was called upon to give testimony about their experiences and what they may have seen or heard at the ashram while the Beatles were there. And I've now seen all these witness statements and there is great unanimity that Magic Alex did cook up the whole thing. Um, uh, Mia Farrow, uh, her name is put in the frame actually by John Lennon um, as being someone that Maharishi was um, behaving badly with. But in fact she was gone, long gone from then. I mean she was there when the Beatles arrived but she wasn't there for much longer. So um, no, it was, I, I, if you can believe all these and if you you know, you can only really believe the witness, the statements of people who actually witness things. And they say, as I say with unanimity, that Alex was guilty of 
manufacturing that whole thing. So I pretty much will be going with that when I come to write volume three. And he's now dead. I did try very, very hard to interview Alex. Um, and I thought, I, I seemed to get a green light and then it went back to red again and it never happened. So um, I can't quote him on the subject. I did actually say to him, you know, put your side of the story, this is the book to do it in, but he never did, and now he's dead. So I probably will go with that, and this time he won't be suing me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Young lady, I've forgotten the name of Sully. Nina Carter. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, not Carter. Nina. 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 Times have changed since the 1960s. Um, are there things that I will be censoring from books two and three because potentially they might make the Beatles put the Beatles in a bad light in the way that we now view things today? You're talking about the possibility of them having underage girls, for example, or other things of that ilk. Uh, and so far, I can honestly say I haven't had turned up any evidence at all of them doing that except in America where the age of consent was 21, um, which over, and over here it was 16. But at 21 for a, a girl to be like in a hotel room, you know, and I think quite possibly there were, you know, there were, I think I'm right in saying 21, maybe it's 18, but whatever it was, there were one or two girls. Paul was going with um, an American actress whose name momentarily escapes me, um, but, she was, um, she's written a book about you know, her nights with Paul, and she, I think she was 17 or 18 at the time. So not exactly a girl, and not what we would now classify as underage, but maybe because the line was drawn differently in those days, technically she was. But um, that is really about the most of it. Um, no, that is the most of it. I haven't found out anything that I'm thinking, oh, God, I can't. I want to use everything I find that's relevant. So I wouldn't want to be censoring myself. On the other hand, I wouldn't wish to be the cause of people taking against the Beatles for reasons that, you know, this, this kind of, this, this thing we all do these days of judging yesterday by today's standards, which is a minefield in itself. No, I'm glad to say, relieved to say, that I haven't found anything that would really cast the Beatles in that kind of light. I think they also admitted that John had always said about him, there's photographs of him in Amsterdam crawling out of the brothels and they took him there and things like that. So yeah. it doesn't shock us anymore, that's the thing. It's, mm. it's long gone now. Yeah. Was it was the, the Australian documentary where they came up with things that were going on in Australia yeah. in June 64? Australia was the tour that, that, that they really were, they were furthest from home um, and uh, you know everything was available and they helped themselves. Um, but bands do on the road. And um, when John Lennon talked in 1970 to Rolling Stone about, you know, orgies and all that, he's really mostly referring to that one tour, actually. I mean, it, there, there was stuff going on in America, of course, but that was the, the wildest I think he'd ever got. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not Led Zeppelin standards or, <laughs> uh, you know, so I think it's all right, really. It's just the young guys on the road and, and everyone was consenting. There we go. Question there by the post. Yeah, my, my favourite record here, huge, and I was listening to it in the car for him the other night, and they were playing a lead guitar through it. And I always remember Paul McCartney didn't want a lead guitar in that uh, song. However, you've heard all the tapes. Is there a version with mm. a lead guitar in it? So this gentleman was in the cavern the other night and heard Hey Jude done with kind of an answering lead guitar phrase by whoever it was, the guitarist. Um, and he remembered that Paul McCartney has said in interviews that actually George Harrison wanted the Beatles version to have that. And he had to say to him, actually, I, I, don't, want it. I don't want it on my song, um, which was an issue between them. And it wasn't one that either man forgot in a hurry um, because it was tricky. You know, he had to say to George, I don't want it. It's a good idea, but maybe, but I don't want it. Um, did the Beatles ever record it that way? Is there a tape in the archive 
even though ultimately they didn't use it, is there a tape? And the answer is no, there isn't. Um, I think it was just something that came up and, and Paul said, I don't want it. And so they never actually did it that way. It was going to be, as Paul's described, it was a hey Jude, down, down, don't make it back, down, down. So Paul just said, mm, no, no, I don't want it. But it became, it was something between the two of them that actually they took a while to get over. I'm not actually sure George ever did. Because in the Beatles, you would bring your best to the table and George was trying to enhance Paul's song and Paul had to say, no, no, I'm sorry. So, um, and maybe he didn't say it in a very nice way in the heat of the moment, who knows? Uh, but there's nothing on tape. You know, when the Beatles were in the studio, they would, the engineers, because tape was expensive, and you didn't want to keep changing the reels, which typically would last 30 minutes, they, the engineers were trained to switch off the, they call it the tape, between takes. So when they're going to do another one, they'll switch it back on again, but when they finished it, they'll switch it off. So you, there's not as much conversation on those tapes as you would hope. And that conversation, which might have been recorded, wasn't. I was reading the other day, I, I don't know if you, if you agree with it, there, there's some footage of that recording session. It, 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 there's more of it came out in the anthology, but it was broadcast back in the 60s, where you sort of see Paul and George discussing, there's no sound, it's silent film. Yeah. Paul and George, George is there playing guitar, and Paul sort of, not agreeing with it, but you can see it. whether it's capturing that exact moment, I don't oh, know. But then okay. the film that came out, George is in the control room because he's sitting there. Yeah. It says a bit about two crates of you saying twist and shout. Yeah. That's the little bit included. Yeah. So whether he got a bit of a huff and gone to the control room and the other three just did the backing track yes. and the rough rehearsals. But somebody actually said it actually captures that moment. So I don't know I don't know if he mm. does, I don't know whether I agree with that far. Mm. But it could be that they are rehearsing. Yeah. George is saying, well, I wonder if I play this. And Paul's yeah. like, no. And that's why George goes up to the control room yeah. and watches the session. He's yeah. not participating in well, it. Well, they have to include him in the film because mm. it was the Beatles they yeah. needed the four. Mm. So I don't know. Yes. Okay, thank you. Hands went up in the middle there somewhere. Just one at the back and then we'll come to you first. One at the back first. I could only hear some of what you said, unfortunately, but if I caught the gist of it, it was that in the present day, Paul, Yoko, Ringo and um, Olivia have to agree on whatever it is that's done in the collective name of the Beatles. Yeah. Right. Well, I, 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 in a few years' time, it's all going to change because um, you know those those four people aren't going to be around anymore, and I have no idea. I, I would imagine that since the Beatles is is kind of a, a very valuable asset, um, one that needs protection as well as, uh, in the nicest sense of the word, exploitation, um, that they're going to have to, they probably already have put plans in place for how they go forward, um, whether it's still four votes or whether it becomes 44 votes with all the children and grandchildren and so on, I really don't know. It's a private arrangement, but I'd be very surprised if by this point they haven't made it. Uh, I did ask about 10 years ago of the guy who runs Apple you know, what happens then, uh, and he said at that point, we don't know, but I imagine by now they have to have looked to me. I mean, Yoko is not in the strongest of health anymore, and she's 85, 
Um, you know, Paul Ringo is 78, Paul is 76. I'm not sure about Olivia, she's probably about 73. So it's something that they need to, I'm sure they have thought about. Um, but what they do with it, I can only speculate, and I have no, you know, no more inside information on it than you do. Um, so I really don't know, but surely they've thought about it and there will be plans. Um, because, as I said, the Beatles, A, it's, um, it's a source of income for everybody, um, but it, it, can't be, um, it can't be raped, if you like, it's got to be looked after with care uh, and artistically respected. And I'm sure they will. Mm. At least I hope they will. Do you think that the children, the next generation, we've, luckily we've got people like Stella, yeah. their own business, we've got Yoko's been planning John's releases, so Sean will probably take that. Perhaps, sort of thing. yes. Danny will take, Olivia again has been planning the releases. Yes. Uh, so may, we, maybe each family will nominate one child. Mm -hmm. um, we'll get protected that way, I would, I would think. Yes, yes, potentially so, but I don't know, maybe, maybe they, it could even be, and don't quote me on this because I'm merely speculating, but it could even be that they've got some plan in place to sell it to someone, some organisation that's going to take care of it and simply release the funds to, um, to the families. I don't know. Yeah. Right, we've got one on the end here, then we've got one that's side. So. Can I follow on from the library? A bit louder. Can I follow on from the library? Yes. Did you ever interview the library? Mm. Mm. Um, so it was a follow-on from the question about Maharishi. Um, did I interview Maharishi? That was the first one. No, I'm afraid I didn't. Um, virtually no one did really about the Beatles, at least. Um, what was the second part? Uh, Is it for some film? Magic Alex. Oh, sorry. Um, well. I think it's more about Magic Alex. If, if, if all this is right that Alex was the cause of, of the problem, um, it will probably be because um, John was his great friend and was, uh, you know, probably chiefly responsible for Apple bankrolling Alex in Apple Electronics. Um, they, they had a strong friendship, the two of them. Um, and, and, you know, friendships for everybody in life are prone to the influence of others, but particularly when you've got famous people and those who wish to curry favour with them, that you know that they would try and jostle themselves into a more positive position. So the suggestion is that Alex was simply wanting to make sure that George John didn't fall under any further under the influence of Maharishi, that that he came back to England <coughs> and, and you know, was, was his friend again. I wasn't there, so I don't really know, but that sounds logical. That sounds logical, yeah. And George Harrison, a song about India. I've always read that, it wasn't Tom Yeah, um, John Lennon did a song about India, didn't he? Which is aired in the Lost Lennon Tapes radio series. Um, yeah, called, called India. Uh, and John did Child of Nature, uh, which was on the road to Rishikesh. That's what the melody became, Jealous Sky. Um, and he did a song called The Happy Rishi Kesh Song, which was seemingly written later. Um, and there's a recording of that, it's, not, it's more ad lib than anything else. Um, but I can't think of one that George did expressly about India. Yeah, I think maybe it's just a wonderful session because there was, there was a, mm. the, the uh, tape boxes were very vague Indian music type yeah. titles because there was no titles for them. So. Yes. It's one that's like Octopus's Garden, I should like to live up a tree, somebody called it, because Ringo was probably improvising yeah. the words that journalists say, oh, he's written one called I should like to live up a tree. Mm. It just happened to be a line that Ringo sang yeah. when he was ad living. Yes. So things get twisted and yeah. misrepresented, so maybe it was just that. I actually did go to Rishikesh this year. I went to look around the ashram and it was amazing, absolutely amazing. And I went to Bombay where George recorded uh, half of the Wonderwall album at the uh, HMV studios in Bombay, Mumbai. And, uh, and the Inner Lights was recorded there as well. So great to be there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Moved on. Okay, okay. this is one back up here, then we'll go to you again. <laughs> I know you use predominantly uh, primary documents and, and your own interviews. Yeah. Yeah. Do you also read other Beatle author, contemporary Beatle authors, and who would you hold in high regard? Um, so I use I use primary documents and interviews as the as the as the main basis for the for the research I do. Um, but do I also read contemporary Beatles books? And if so, who do whose work do I like? Um, I, I I have very little reading time to be absolutely honest because I'm too busy researching and then I'll soon be writing. Um, and if I'm reading, I'm not doing either of those things. Um, so I tend to confine myself to the primary works. Um, works by people who written by people who are actually present or in, involved in things. Um, so you know, wives, friends, colleagues, you know, people associate to the Beatles. Um, most of the modern day authors are writing second hand, um, and they're interpreting, which is perfectly fine. And the Beatles are absolutely valid for that approach. Um, but I, because I can see that they're not, it's just somebody else's opinion, as it were, I, I don't give them much attention. I have them all, um, and it could well be that when I come to write about whatever it might be, an, an element of the story, I think, well, there's actually a book on that, so I'll see, because other people are doing research as well, and they could find people and information I don't have. Um, but I try to confine myself to primary things at, at, at all, in all cases because I'm not so interested in, in second-hand stuff. Mm. So I've got one in front, then we'll come back to you, okay? Are you interested in the uh, publishing side? Are you interested in all the first uh, record that was published and having this period of that story? Yeah. Because it's 1963 and the fellow by the name of Dick Chambers seems to say, uh, and George Harrison doesn't have to publish it. Mm. Uh, you know, Ryan's very involved in that. So what can you give us a little bit of flavour and you're approaching that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's another question about the publishing. Um, publishing being songs. Songs are published like books are published. You actually, you know, you register them or you, in the way that it was always done, you, you, you give them to a company, they take the copyright, they publish it and they pay you receipts of any they share out the income that that song actually generates. Uh, and the Beatles' first single, the two sides were published by Ardmore and Beechwood. And then after that, from Please Please Me and Ask Me Why, it was Dick James. And although it then went to Northern Songs, Northern Songs was a company that Dick James suggested be formed and half owned, along with John, Paul and Brian owning the other half. Uh, am I going to go down that rabbit hole? Yeah, and how far down? Well, pretty. I've got to go pretty deep down that rabbit hole um, because it's important. Because um, you know, ultimately, John and Paul came to lose control of their copyrights. Um, although they were always rewarded well for it, um, they never actually ended up. They didn't end up owning them. So it's an important story that needs to be told, and it's the story of the business um, because you know when the Beatles first made a record in 62, they joined an existing business. Two businesses, the record business and the music business. Music being the song side, records being the recorded side. So they joined the business. Ultimately, they changed, certainly the recording business, they changed quite thoroughly. Um, and they also had a big, a big impact on publishing. So I will be looking at all of this. Um, and it was the reason why John and Paul were so much wealthier than George and Ringo, because they had the income from the songs that George and Ringo couldn't share in. So, uh, and George formed a company called Harris Songs for his songs, but in fact the original Harris Songs he formed in 1964 was merely a, a kind of a, a tax shelter or a tax efficient shelter for his income from songs. And he had Don't Bother Me by that point, um, and would soon have a few more. Harris Songs became active as a publisher from 68, from the White Album, but earlier than that, it had always been George's, kind of a, you know, a safe haven for George's money, as safe as it was from the tax man in those days, which was never very safe. Um, which is also something I should be looking at in detail, how the Beatles, 
tried to hang on to their money because the taxman was going to take pretty much all of it. You know, one for you, 19 for me was more or less the ratio, not quite, but more or less. So, you know, the, all sorts of weird and wonderful schemes were put in place. Not illegal, not unlawful schemes, but things whereby they could try and keep some of what was rightfully theirs. I think that's a, one of the little nuggets in the ruttles, as going back to what we were saying earlier, yeah. where the Dick James character is called Dick Jaws. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the commentary says that he signed them up for the rest of their lives, and wonderfully played by Barry Curran, he says, yeah, lucky really. <laughs> and I think that just speaks volumes about the whole well, it, another thing it speaks volumes for is George Harrison's dim view of Dick James. Mm. Um, because Dick James was doing nothing wrong. In fact, he was more generous with the Beatles than most other publishers would have been. But he ends up looking like the bad guy. So that's an interesting story. Mm. Yeah, George was unhappy with anybody taking anything of his ever. Um, which you can understand. And he was also no keen taxpayer. As Terry Gilliam says in the Martin Scorsese film about George's life, only George Harrison would make himself a Swiss resident for the last few months of his life, merely in order to deny the, any death duties being paid on his estate. Um, I mean, it was his money, tax had already been paid on it, so you can understand it, but that, those were the lengths that George in particular was prepared to go in order to avoid paying any tax. And Derek Taylor, um, may he rest in peace, and I'm sure he is, said to me a few times that um, he used to argue because Derek was a keen socialist, and George, who had grown up on a council estate and knew well the benefits of a, of a socialist state, um, George didn't want to pay any tax ever. And Derek was saying, well, you know, how are people, where's the health service going to be paid from, and, and the holes in the roads are. Uh, and all of that, you know, all the fabric of our society, and George going, well, they're not getting my money. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so that was why they had, he had that view on Dick George. There we go, we've got one there, then we've got two over. Come back in that order, come back in a second. Yeah. Mark, uh, did you ever interview Bill Harry in person? Have I interviewed Bill Harry in person? Uh, I think I may have done once, yes I did do once in about 1985, but not really since then. But Bill, is, Bill has been a prolific writer of, of his story and his part in it. Uh, and um, so I, I kind of, I'm okay, I'm covered. You know, you don't necessarily need to interview everybody, you have to weigh up what you're going to get uh, and, and how much you'll be able to use of it, so I haven't actually interview Bill, who's now about, what is Bill now, about 82 now, I think, or 80 or 82. Yeah. Um, but uh, I am, you know, he is a hero, a hero of the story, because Mercy Beat newspaper wouldn't have happened without him. And in, the six, in volume two, he continues to have quite a part in it. I met him last week, and he was more or less a bit complaining about you, that you never did. <laughs> oh, right, okay. And I'm, I'm sure you will be happy to meet him. Right, okay. Well, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. But I, I do have Bill's part in things um, pretty well covered. But, um, yeah, I will. Thank you. Thank you for telling me that. I, I'll, pick yeah, on, I'll pick up on that. His wife is not very good. Virginia, yeah. But he now says I have to come out more. Okay. So I'm sure he will be All right. pleased. Fine, then I will. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One there, one there, one there, one there, so we'll go that way. Mm -hmm. One in the middle first. Okay. Um, I was interested in who was in the songs and who did what in the songs. Yeah. Doing your past research, have you um, found out things that surprised you where you found out somebody did something or somebody wrote part of the song that you were surprised that you didn't know before? So with songs on the question of who did what, who wrote what, or who contributed what ideas, have I found things out that have surprised me? Um, you know, when it comes to writing songs, it's really about, typically in the case of the Beatles, it's two or three guys in a room. Usually Paul's music room in St. John's Wood or John's music room in Weybridge, typically that's where Lennon and McCartney did most of their work. I wasn't in those rooms. 
and even going to those rooms now wouldn't reveal anything. You have to rely on the people who were present. So really the only information about who did what or who came up with what is down to what Paul has said or John has said uh, about who wrote what. And so I don't really have any particular fresh stuff to add. Um, I'll be using the, the given knowledge differently perhaps, um, and more fully perhaps, and, and certainly more contextually so it will seem new and interesting and surprising. But in reality, I can't know any more than they've said about who wrote what. Um, that's, that's, that's about it. Yeah. Have you seen the news this week about the computer program that's worked it all out? Yeah, yeah, about um, Paul, was it Paul writing more in my life than John? Is that what it is? Yeah. Uh, I, can't imagine, I can't imagine Paul's reaction to that. Uh, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't be so blase as to completely disregard that, but no, I, I, it's, not, it's not important what a computer thinks about it. So that melody line is typical of Paul, that melody line is typical of John, and, and that's interesting. Um, but because I wasn't in the room, I, I really can't go jump into fresh conclusions that would, would be essentially guesses. Mm. Yeah, not everything, there will be disputes probably forever. Not everything can be known. That comes back to this business of no one knows everything about everything. You know? um, and when I am writing those sections of tune in where John and Paul disagreed on how much each wrote of Eleanor Rigby, say, so I'll just put both down. Because I, I don't know, why should I be the judge of, of that? Hmm. Question just behind, we'll come back to you, set. we've got a few in before, but just one behind you there. Well, uh, Mark, I think comments of Adams have maybe many of people sort of think but only maybe a couple of Adams have sort of been the peak. Yeah. Robert Rowland, the John was in the 1962. Mm. Have you ever This is Ron Watson of Southport who did see the Beatles in 61, 62 a number of times uh, and has good cause to ask the question, are there other recordings of the Beatles in that period when they were just a kind of what we'd now call a covers band, but that, you know, that wasn't really what they were, um, but when they were doing the rock songs on the stage, right, in Liverpool particularly and Hamburg. And the answer is there are no known recordings that we haven't yet heard. There are rumours, well there was one that came up from Sotheby's in about 85 that purported to be a reel of tape of the Beatles in the cavern in I think July 62. Um, and I was uh, a consultant to Sotheby's in those days and went in and heard a cassette transfer of it and it was so inaudible. The quality was so atrocious I couldn't even make out what songs they were doing. Uh, and Paul McCartney bought that tape in 1985 and we've never heard it or seen it since. Um, but probably he got it home and thought, oh, God, I can't make out Eddie Taylor this, because the quality was that poor. Um, you hear rumours from time to time. When I was writing Tune In, I actually met a man who had recorded the Beatles at Litherland Town Hall and he still had some tapes that didn't have any writing on the boxes and I did everything I could to encourage him to, to listen to those tapes and identify and I said I'll be there if you want me to you know, help validate anything but he got back in touch and said I have listened to them and I, I didn't think there was anything to do with the Beatles there and yeah there isn't so um, you know he's now dead and I assume the tape, I don't know where the tapes are but he said there is nothing so no there's, there's really nothing there's a guy called Fellow Workman in Holland used to say in the 1980s that he had, a, a, I think, a film of the Beatles in the Top Ten Club. Is that right, Dave? A film of the Beatles in or the Star Club, or and the Star Club. But he hasn't ever shown them to anybody. Um, and it's just like, well, if you're not, you know, maybe you haven't got it at all. 
you know, people do like to claim things. I'm not suggesting he was making it up, but if he's got it, show it. Think, you know. I would say things like that. People have said 20, 30 years ago that they've got something. By now, we should have seen something of it by now, because mm. there's things like eBay and goodness knows what that people sell everything on. Yeah. And, you know, the law of the money is. Yeah. There are recordings to surface though, not from the early period, but from 63 onwards, stuff is still coming up. You know, bits of film that we haven't seen before, interviews we haven't heard before, press conferences we haven't had film of before. So amazingly, how stuff is still surfacing. But from the really early days, no. Another holy grail for me is a colour photograph of the Beatles in the cavern. There isn't one. The only pictures we have of them there are black and white. Is there a colour one out there? Seemingly not, but you never know. Pete <laughs> first. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, so the question was, uh, I am uh, purported to be the authority, well, you know, I'm not even entirely comfortable with that word, but is there a second, is there like a someone is there a mini mark? Yeah, or a younger mark? Well, there will have to be a younger me one day. You know, someone else needs to carry this forward um, from the next generation. Um, yes, I do. Dave. Yeah. Yeah, well, certainly this guy here. I don't know if he was properly introduced by himself, but. No, I don't. I'm the master, so I just said. Dave Ravenscroft, this is. And I say this every year because he sits here every year. He is an immense help to me, and I turn to him a lot. Um, what was this about? What was happening there? Can you have? You, is there anything on this? You know. So, Dave is, is the closest thing I have to a right hand man. Um, so, yeah. And he's also a great help to other people I know, um, and very generous with your time and expertise. So, but I don't really have an answer to your question. Um, other than to say that Beatles research is available to all and that there are some great books in the last 15 years in particular that have been published that go that drill deep on particular elements of the story and go deeper than I will ever have the time to go. So there's Brian Kehoe and Kevin Ryan who did, did the recording the Beatles about all the equipment in the studios that were used or the microphones and everything with the instruments. Is Andy Babuke, who's done the book Beatles Gear, about all their instruments. Fantastic piece of work. I would never have done that. Um, so when I need to know about the Beatles instruments, I go to Andy's book. It's not my knowledge I'm using, it's his. Um, and provided that you know that other people's research is, is, is properly strong and tested, then it's all fair game for use. Um, Chip Madinger did a brilliant book on John Lennon after the Beatles and you know pretty much a day-to-day -day chronology of every bit of film, every recording, every demo. I went to the British Library museum on Saturday and they reviewed Yeah, yeah, and there's um, John Wynne who did a couple of great discography books. They're brilliant discographies of the Beatles. There's a guy called Christoph Mouse who's done a book of every, every foreign record sleeve. Um, which is of great use to me if I want to know about a release in Argentina, what was on it, when did it come out, what was the cover, I pulled his book off the shelf. So there's a lot of very fine researchers and authorities out there. I'm not the only one. Mm -hmm. we got one there, then one at the back here, then one over here. <laughs> right. The question about Raymond Jones. Raymond Jones has a place in the Beatles story as the young lad, I think 18 years old, who in October 1961 went into Brian Epstein's record shop, NEMS, and asked for a copy of My Bonnie by Tony Sheridan and the Beatles, and that set Brian on the path to finding out more about them and ultimately, very quickly, becoming their manager. It was claimed by Alastair Taylor who used to be here at this event every year 
way back in the 80s and 90s and then died. Um, Alistair claimed that he was Raymond Jones, that he basically uh, invented this fictitious character in order to get this record under Brian's nose and therefore had him order it. A bit of a strange thing to claim and one that was quite offensive to Raymond Jones uh, who was alive and well and at that point living in Spain who said I do exist <laughs> and um, I have spoken to him on the phone Spencer Lee who was another authority on the Merseyside scene particularly um, he has had Raymond Jones on his radio show I've seen letters to and from Raymond Jones including from Ryan Epstein to Raymond Jones please give me your current address so I can send you a copy of my book A Cellar of Noise because that was the book that revealed that story. So yeah, Raymond Jones definitely did exist and I don't know what prompted Alistair to, to make up a story that he had invented it, but sometimes people do things like that. Mm. Uh, finally, we get to you. <laughs> yeah, and uh, there is a uh, famous American drummer called Bernard Curry uh, who has been a session drummer for Rolling Stones and a lot of bands. Yes. He has claimed in uh, many interviews that he Well, it's, so do I need to repeat that or did everybody hear it? Yeah. Should I repeat it? Anybody need me to repeat it? Yeah. An American drummer called Bernard Purdy, Bernard Purdy, I think is how it would be pronounced, um, claims, has long claimed to have been the drummer on many of the Beatles recordings and that it wasn't Ringo at all, it was really him and Ringo was no good and if it wasn't for him, the, the Beatles wouldn't have tracked up, wouldn't have such good drumming, etc., etc. The question was, have I found anything to prove it? And the answer is, you can't prove a negative. Uh, he, it definitely wasn't him. So you can't prove that because, other than to say there is no evidence that it was him, because it wasn't him. It really wasn't him. I don't know what ever prompted him to make such outlandish claims. Um, I think he first did it as a was it the late 70s or early 80s he first started to say this and gained some notoriety as a result? Um, it's not true. The only connection that Bernard or Bernard Purdy has to Beatles tracks is when Atlantic Records of New York bought the rights to some of the German Polydor recordings made by the Beatles in 61, 62. Um, that for reasons of their recording, uh, as produced by Bert Kampfer, were quite light on the drums because he basically stopped Pete from using most of his kit and so they didn't have much of a drum sound on them, those tracks. Not nothing, but not heavy. And so he was brought in by Atlantic Records in New York to overdub certain of those 1961 recordings for American release. Uh, he never said that, by the way. He only talked about the EMI releases, but he undoubtedly had nothing to do with EMI, the, any of the, the Beatles' main catalogue. Uh, and one of the times when it, because it used to surface every three or four years as a fresh story, every time he did a new interview, it would be in the news again, pre-internet, and just be in the whatever newspapers saying, American musicians claimed he drummed on Beatles records. And one occasion when it came up, was a day when I happened to have an appointment to see George Martin. <clears throat> I used to see him quite often and it was in his studio in Hampstead. I was recording him, must have been 93 or 4, was when the Red and the Blue albums came out on CD. The EMI put out a promotional interview, a CD, with George Martin talking about those tracks. And although my voice was cut out of that <coughs> interview, it was me that did it. And I, at the end of it I said to him, Bernard Purdy is up in the news today and he said, I oh, know, he's driving me mad. He said, I think Bernard Purdy is a great drummer. I've used him on other sessions, you know, post Beatles, work in America. Um, he's a very fine drummer and I respect his drumming, but I don't know what he's talking about claiming to be the Beatles drummer. So, you know, I, I'm with George Martin on that one and everybody else. There's also the story of another chap in America who claimed to play George's guitar as part on the Absolution show. Really? Yes. 
who, who is this? Can't give his name. But you sent me the cuttings and said, "What do you think of this?" And it's just I forgot he, about that. He claimed to because it's like round the back of the stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot about no, it. You, I don't know. It's, things are easily claimed, and then you can spend like half a lifetime. Like you said to me, what proof have I got that he didn't? Well, his name is not on any piece of paper, but on no piece of paper does it say Bernard Purdy is not on this track. Yeah, no, well, I haven't got inside the Capitol archives, but there won't be anything because the drumming on the American releases of the Beatles is the same so, as the British. So, mm. <laughs> there we go, there's another issue, but that's it, yeah. I wanted to go back to something you said about uh, more and more books coming up that are kind of specialized to certain yeah. areas, including many of yours, which are live. The live gates and the recording sessions are very well documented. Why are photo sessions not? Uh, uh, so why are people's photo sessions not the subject of it, it just seems like that, that would be something that would have a date, a date <coughs> yeah. in a diary or something, or written on the back of the prints yeah. or something. Well, so the question was, there are books about all elements of the Beatles story, but photo sessions per se, there's no one book that kind of covers it, or a series of books, which is what you need. But the reality for that is that they will take, all the photos were taken by different people and have different ownership. Um, so Deso Hoffman did his books, and Robert Freeman did his, and Bob Whittaker did his, and Michael Cooper did his, or it was done for him. And Tom Murray, who's out there, has done his, and so has Don McCullin. So there is no one Mad Day Out book, for example. You've got two different books. There were about seven photographers present on that day, but there is no one collection of the pictures. So I think it really comes down to copyright and ownership, and you would have to get everybody in agreement. These days, a lot of people's photographs are owned by Apple, and not only are they unlikely to do such a thing, but they would probably try and clamp down on anybody else doing it. So uh, there are people out there who uh, very carefully amass the work of photographers, so it's all in one place on their computer as PDFs. There are websites, of course, as the Savage Young Beatles has got like all the early pictures of the Beatles um, from any source put together not by clearing copyright, but I'm very glad it, they've done it because it's a great resource. So that's, I think, the answer. In a lot of those books, though, even like Deso Hoffman's, it's the dates are all all wrong. I mean, or they're yeah. pretty inaccurate, and or just a month or something. It's yeah, Deso Hoffman's dates are wrong. Caption captions are wrong in many books. It's it's just one of those things. It's um it's carelessness or. The person's remembering as best they can, but they're not bothering to find out whether it's right or not. At the end of the day, books come. Books are put together by individuals. You know, it's an editor, it's a, it's a, someone who owns the content, and it's an editor and it's a publisher. And if they care not to bother about the detail and making sure that it's absolutely right, then it will be wrong. And there are mistakes in all books on the leaders, probably including mine, <laughs> made with the best of intentions, but you know, you can't help it sometimes. Mm. A couple of questions here, first of all, there. Yeah. Sorry? Yes, say first of all, there, then we'll go over behind you. Uh, um, Mark? Yes? You've um, amassed a, a massive archive over the years, I imagine. And a lot of that will be paper-based. And yeah. um, I know from record-keeping with the organisation that I work in, that if it doesn't get digitised at some stage, yeah. that paperwork will disappear. Yes. Um, do you have any plans for your archive? Yeah. Or should it be digitised now? Um, <clears throat> my, so the question is, uh, I have, through researching, I've now been researching the Beatles for well, 40 years next year. Um, I've amassed a lot of paperwork. Am I digitising it and am I taking steps to ensure its long-term preservation, right? Um, I'm aware that I probably, I must have, I'm sure, the, the greatest collection of Beatles information on paper. You know, a lot of people in this room collect different aspects of the Beatles. There might be records or ephemera, whatever it might be, photographs. I collect pieces of paper. Um, letters, contracts, receipts, bills of all kinds, any, any piece of paper whatsoever. And either as originals or photocopies or scans or photographs of pieces of paper, I have 
hundreds of thousands probably. Uh, and they're in mixed media at the present time. I haven't had the, the wherewithal to digitise everything. <clears throat> I, I would like ultimately for everything to be digitised, but it would take like an army of people quite a long time and therefore it needs financing and I don't have the funds. So at present time it's all mixed media in my office. Um, but ultimately it should be done. And um, I do have it in mind to ensure that my collection of all this, 40 years of, 50 years of being a Beatles fan and 40 years of looking out for things, um, that it will ultimately go into some public archive so it can be accessible for all time for anybody who's interested in finding out whatever they want to look for. Because I do have pretty much everything covered. Um, so it's, it's going to go into a library or an archive at some point in the future. Either I will oversee its handover or it will happen after I've gone. Um, but it does need to happen, it, it, it can't be scattered, it needs to be kept together. And I'm aware of the responsibility of making sure that it goes into a library or a place of study somewhere. Mm. And I do say to people who have got things, I, I could say it to the room, but I would particularly say it to people who were actively involved in things, if you would like to entrust me with anything that you've got, that you want to know that it's going to go into an archive or a library, and be available for people to look at in the future so that your part in things can still survive you, then I'll be a, an honest broker and I'll take care of it for the time being. Um, and it can go into the archive along with all my stuff. So, yeah. One minute, I'm going to come again in a second. Um, are you aware of the everyday chemistry sort of mixed tape album and the story behind it? Am I aware of the everyday chemistry, did you say? Yeah, mixtape. Uh, mixtape. What is it? Mix CD, the mixed CD, um, so the story behind it goes that someone allegedly so you met a uh, cover from a parallel universe where the Beatles are still together <laughs> and uh, it did them with a album that they made. Right. They were still together. But when you listen to it, it's pretty clear that it's not. Work. Right, no, I'm, I'm not aware of that. Um, I'm not sure I need to be aware of that. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm not to deny anybody their beliefs, but uh, I try to stick to what actually exists in the real world. So, um, I mean, it's interesting that that mixtape comes from this other plane, and yet we have it as physical product down here on Earth. <laughs> so, um, no, I'm not, I'm not aware of it, but. Um, I'm aware that there are lots of people doing things with their computers these days, some of which is really interesting. Um, but no, it's, I, I've, I, my hands are full, and my, my brain is full with focusing on what happened in the 60s, let alone today. So. Yeah, yeah. Just got time for a couple more, I've got one there. <laughs> Do I have a copy of the John Barrett notes from EMI, the, the, the notes that he made when he was going through the recordings in the 80s when he was ill? Yes, I do. I do have that. Yeah. And there's also a book by John Wynne, isn't there, which actually sets it all out in, in print form. Uh, have I got them in colour? Oh, <laughs> it's amazing what people have, isn't it? <laughs> right, okay. Oh, I'd be pleased to have them in colour. Sure, why not? Why not? Sorry? Two PDFs. Two PDFs, yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, one last question we've got. Who's going to be the last question? There we go. Check that. Okay. Sorry, Kunst. Yeah. All right. But you are in, so what is it? I've got two questions. Okay. Can you speak up with just a touch? Beatles Monthly Magazine that Mark used to write for. Yeah, why, why is that in? Why? Okay, I'll answer this and then I'll come back to your second part, shall I? Okay. Uh, Beatles Monthly Magazine ended in, was it 2002? 2001. 2001. Um, 
simply because the it, it had always been pretty much a one man operation. Well, one owner, a man called Sean O'Mahony, who took the editorial nickname Johnny Dean. Johnny Dean didn't actually exist. Sean O'Mahony was the publisher, and he was kind of de facto editor as well. And um, he was a He's still alive. He's, I won't speak of him in the past tense, but he's not very well. Um, he was a curious guy as a publisher because he he wasn't interested in making more money than 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 the basic. So, for example, he never had advertising, classified ads, perhaps, but never any actual block advertising. Maybe at the end he did, but. Essentially, the Beatles Monthly, right through the 60s, no advertising, and then when it revived in 76, no advertising either. So he was just this guy who liked to publish magazines of that kind, fan magazines. And um, he, his, his resources were limited. He had the Leslie Bryce photo collection. Leslie Bryce was the official photographer for the Beatles Monthly. And when the magazines were used the first time in the 60s, he used some. When they began to be reissued in 76, he used more. When he re-entered entered a new reissue phase, or kind of new issue phase in 82, he was using more. And by the time of 2001, he's using the same pictures over and over and over and over and over again. There was nothing new in it anymore. And the articles weren't that brilliant, to be honest, um, because Sean was fixed on the formula, I didn't really want to vary it. So a lot of people used to get it out of loyalty, but not necessarily read it. Um, the circulation was heading in only one direction, not towards the band one direction, but it was heading for the floor. So there came a point when the circulation wasn't enough for him to even bother. So the strangest thing was he made the pronouncement that, you know, Beatles fan, the Beatles have kind of peaked now and, and there's, loss of interest but of course there's been no such thing which makes his final statement to be a bit strange but other than that it was great that he did it and he certainly gave me my break in terms of writing about the Beatles I mean my first ever writing about the Beatles was in his magazine <coughs> what was the second part of the final question Yes. Uh, which do you think are the best solo biographies of the Beatles? Well, and, and yeah. And what? And, and books on the Beatles. Oh, and books on the Beatles. Um, yeah. If I was ha <laughs> if I was happy with the. Um, existing biographies of the Beatles, I wouldn't have felt the need to write the trilogy that I'm doing. So, um, Hunter Davis is the original biographer and his book is full of original information. Um, it's the seminal work, really, in that regard. But it's not really good enough anymore. I mean, it, he did it 50 years ago and, and there's, a, there's, there's a greater demand, there's a demand now for greater level of detail and understanding of the subject than he had at the time. But he did the right job at the, at the time, I'm convinced of that. So that's the seminal work really in terms of biography. Um, but I'm trying to kick it out of the park basically, <laughs> um, in a nice way. Um, the solo ones. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I don't really want to sit up here dismissing other authors. But I, I would say that the best John Lennon book is still to be written, or biography. And I would say that's true for all four of them, actually. Um, and I'd be very happy if, if people or someone, probably people, plural, would actually take it, take it on and do it. Maybe try to do what I'm doing to this kind of level and depth and standard to the Beatles, the, the ex-Beatles in those years. The most I'm ever going to go is 74. I'm not going to write beyond that. So there's plenty of scope for people to write about all the years beyond then. Um, 
and I wish them good luck and I would offer to help them as well in terms of sharing information because I, I do have plenty because I do think that they're underserved at the moment I, I, I can't think of a good McCartney biography to recommend um, what? Surely many years from now. Well, that's the Miles book, Barry Miles. Yeah, that's a good book. That's a very good book. But it's it's really mostly about the 60s, not about Paul, not about Wings and all of that. So, no. Yeah, there's a good book about McCartney's recordings that I understand is being written at the moment, and I'm looking forward to that. And that, in a sense, between the lines, will be a, a biography of, of a sort. But no, I think the best books on them are still to be written. Mm. Maybe by your good self. Yeah. And with, with that, we're going to have to bring it to a close because Mark's been working now since, well, about eight hours now. Mark's been on stage talking. Yeah. And I'm sure he wants a bit of a rest. And yeah. I bet you, you're going to be ended up signing loads of books and yeah. everything. So I will, I'll be happy to sign anything if anybody wants anything to sign. So for I'll, now, we'll have to bring it to a I'll close. sit here and if you want to come up there or whatever, then we'll. One more question. So mm. can you ask it after? Because we're going to have to draw this to a close now. Yeah. There's always one more, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> always leave, but once more.